All right, well, it's, uh, it's Pentecost Sunday, and uh, I, this sermon has a rather uninspiring title, Understanding Pentecost. Uh, but anyway, um, in the second chapter of Acts, we have the account of the first Christian Pentecost. And I emphasize the word Christian because Pentecost is much older than the Christian church. But in the second chapter of Acts, it says, verse 1, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now just a note here, the word tongue doesn't mean that, it means language. And it's really drawing on the tradition of the King James Bible, because 400 years ago when you said, well, he spoke the English tongue or the German tongue or the Greek tongue. So that's what we mean, we mean languages. And so I'm gonna use the word languages from here on out, even though we commonly say tongues. All right, so they, were all, they all began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. So there's the, there's the word. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia. Now this is just described most of the Middle East all the way to India in the languages of the time and the, how those lands were titled. Today we would say Iran, uh, Armenia and uh, Eastern Turkey. Uh, we would talk about Iraq. That, those are the regions that it's describing. Um, and Judea and Cappadocia, well, we know where Judea is, but Cappadocia is the center of Turkey. And Pontus in Asia, that's Western Turkey. And Phrygia and Pamphylia, that's yet more of Western Turkey. And Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, that's modern day Tunisia. So this is a huge swath of North Africa and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them telling in our own tongues or our own languages the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocked and said they are filled with new wine. Now, before we really dive into this message, I just want to give you a couple more passages of Scripture from the Old Testament. One of them comes from Isaiah the prophet. In Isaiah 59, 21, it says, and as for me... This is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you, referring to Isaiah the prophet, and my words that I put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says the Lord, from this time and forever. Now this is a promise for latter days, but it's a promise of this coming of the spirit on the people of Israel. And it's one of the great prophetic promises, maybe one of the greater ones, but often overlooked in our modern circles. And there's a similar uh, language used by Joel the prophet, who might have actually predated Isaiah, or he might have come after, but either way, Joel says of this same phenomenon, and Peter quotes it in his Pentecost sermon, Joel 2, 28 and 29, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now this is interesting, all flesh means not just the Jewish people. Isaiah is talking to Jews. That's why I put Isaiah ahead of Joel, because Revelation is progressive. And I think what God said to the Jewish people through Isaiah, he then expanded to all the earth through Joel. It would make, wouldn't make sense to do it in reverse order. All right, so it shall come to pass that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Well, it just said, if you caught it, I didn't really highlight it. On Pentecost, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven. It named 15 of them, but every nation under heaven. Well, that's all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. 
Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Well, these are the framing passages for what we in the, in the church call Pentecost Sunday. But what is Pentecost? When I was a kid, I grew up more or less in the church. I mean, it was a bit inconsistent because of my mother's uh, sometimes lukewarmness. But between her and my grandparents, especially my grandparents, um, I, was, I was raised to believe in Jesus. I wasn't one of those that you know, led the uh, proverbial profligate life a little bit because I, I was a teenager and who actually escapes their teens completely <laughs> unscathed. But, but compared with many stories you hear, I was relatively clean. Anyway, um, so I, I heard about Pentecost when I was a kid, and when I heard about it, I learned that, like everyone learned, it, it was the day the Holy Spirit came on the church. And it was kind of like, well, yeah, okay. Because we weren't really talking about the Holy Spirit very much in, in our circles. I mean, we knew that he was something, but most people didn't have encounters with him in those days, uh, unless you were a Pentecostal, maybe. M most people didn't talk about prophesying or dreams and visions or things like that, gifts of healing, etc. cetera. Um, and so there wasn't a lot of explanation given. It was just sort of, yeah, this is what this is. And it's like, well, thanks for that. Duly noted. What's for lunch? <laughs> and so there was little expectation of anything like what we read just now in Acts happening in church. But Pentecost is more than just a footnote in church history. Uh, it's much more than just a, some bland religious holiday. It was then and is even now a significant holiday in the Jewish calendar. Remember, all of this stuff is rooted in Jewish tradition. And whether anyone knows it or rec recognizes it or acknowledges it or not, um, the church rests upon a solid Jewish foundation. Now, I'm not going to turn you into a Judaizer today, I promise. <laughs> but, but part of what the Lord, I think, is doing in our time and it's a generational thing, is he's recovering the essential Jewish roots of Christianity. And actually part of our problem in the church is we have become divorced from those essential Jewish roots. And with that, we've lost our foundation. And that's why we have some of the odd and bizarre teachings that are out there. But anyway, I digress. So Pentecost was not just a Jewish uh, calendared holiday, but it was a great eschatological event when it happened on the day that we just read about. Why? Well, because they've been looking forward to something that they didn't even know exactly what it was. Watch this, since the time of Moses. And Moses gave the law in 1446 BC. So when we are talking about this today, we are talking about something that has a 3,500-year history of Jewish Christian tradition. I think it's important to note that because in our day, there are a lot of people, particularly that are running down the Eastern religions path. We want something ancient. We want something that has, you know, we, we don't want the shallowness of, the, of modernity. We want old stuff. Well, Hinduism is 5,000 years old. Buddhism's about 2,500 years old, so we kind of land nicely in the middle of all that when we talk about Judeo-Christianity and its roots. 3,500 years is what we're talking about. And yet, we don't really talk about Pentecost in the way maybe we could. Even in the high churches, like Catholic churches, we heard a little bit about that this morning, the Orthodox churches, maybe Anglican possibly Lutheran, but now we're starting to dilute a bit. We're no longer really, truly in the high church world. Um, when, we, when we think about those kinds of church movements, they may make a little more of it, but again, the expectation that God might do anything today, that we might have our own new Pentecost, uh, maybe not so much. So Shavuot, as it is known in Hebrew, the Feast of Weeks, is the Jewish holiday that commemorates the giving of the Torah. That's why it's important, and a lot of Christians do not know that. 
What's the Torah? Well, it's the first five books of the Bible, the ones that Moses wrote down. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I could be off on this, but I think we would all do well to familiarize ourselves once again with what's in those books. Not that we have to follow all those rituals anymore, but I do think they lay down profound spiritual principles of how to live, how not to live, what's acceptable in the eyes of God, what's not acceptable in the eyes of God. And uh, when the Lord sent Joshua into the promised land, because Moses didn't make the cut in the end, um, he says to him, this book of the law shall not depart from out of your mouth, you shall meditate on it day and night, for by it you will have good reward. And, and I wonder what kind of success we might have if we kind of oriented ourselves back to some of those foundational truths. Anyway, that was for free. <laughs> All right, so Shavuot, Pentecost as it came to be known, is the observance of the giving of the law. And its observance in the Jewish calendar is always tied to the date of Passover. And it happens to be, as well, the holiday that celebrates the early harvest. Now that's interesting. In Israel, they do have two harvests. They have one that comes in the spring, because they get spring rains and then they get latter rains or autumn rains and there's also an autumn harvest. And so um, I want to suggest to you that what we just read in Acts 2 is the description of the early rain which God intended to send. And a lot of what we've been calling out for for at least a generation and contending for and praying for that we call revival is the latter rain. I know there was a movement in the 1950s known as the Latter Rain Movement, and it was powerful, but I don't think that was the Latter Rain. And I think, I think we're on deck for that, whenever exactly the rains hit. All right, so how did this Shavuot become known as Pentecost in the Christian tradition? Well, it's because Jesus, the Bible tells us, after he rose from the dead, he appeared to them for 40 days. And, uh, and then he ascended into heaven. And for this reason, by the way, in the traditional churches, Ascension Day is always celebrated on a Thursday. Because he rose on a Sunday, and you just count it out, he landed on a Thursday. So Ascension Day, but as he ascended, he said, not many days hence, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Well, he's, that was a way of speaking, the manner of speech in that era. He's saying 10 days from now, you will, you will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. So 40 days with Jesus on the earth with them, and then he ascends, plus 10 more days of earnest seeking, which you guys have just completed 10 days of that, get you to 50 days. And in Greek, which was the common language of the eastern end of the Roman Empire at that time, uh, in Greek, uh, Pentecost derives from the word for 50. So thus we call this celebration, it's no longer called Shavuot uh, for most of us. Those who are more of a Hebrew orientation with their Christian observance, they might still call it that. But the vast majority of the church calls this day Pentecost. And so on Pentecost, as we read, the uh, Holy Spirit descends on 120 people. And as the saying goes, the rest is history. These 120 consisted of the following people. For sure, we know the 11 were there. You may be going, the 11? Well, remember, Judas committed suicide. So we're down one. <laughs> Should be 12, but they haven't appointed Matthias yet, who becomes Matthew. Um, Matthias is just a Greek form of the name Matthew, which is a, which is a morphing of the name Levi. And Levi was the tax collector. He was the fifth apostle that Jesus called in Capernaum. All right, um, so we have the 11, and then we have very likely, I mean, it doesn't say it, so we can't be certain of it, but uh, the, the early church father, I loved it, by the way, that you were, no, you were reading from uh, St. Ephraim, thank you. Um, the early church father, uh, Papias, noted that uh, the 72 were in the upper room. So it's almost certain these were the 72 whom Jesus sent out as disciples to do what the 12 were doing 
He sent the 12 in Matthew 10 and, and in Luke 9, and then he sent the 72 in Luke 10. You might have gotten confused with that one, so I'll say it again. In Luke 9, he sends out the 12, and in Luke 10, he sends out the 72. Luke 9 has a parallel account in Matthew 10. All right, so they're all there. And if you do the math, uh, that takes us up to uh, 83, 11 plus 72. And then that leaves 37 others. Now, again, we don't know who those 37 were, but more than likely, they included uh, the women that were always following Jesus around. Now, there were maybe not 37 of them, and so, as we might say, the dogs and cats, the strays. But, but anyway, this is 120 who were in the upper room. That's who was there. And that actually gives me a lot of hope because it tells me that you don't have to be a nameplate apostle to participate in Pentecost. Isn't that cool? We don't even know the names of the 72, although some of the church fathers, uh, Eusebius, the historian in the third century, he likes to suggest the names of some of these. But, but nobody actually knew all of the names. So even if you assume that Eusebius had it right, he didn't have them all. And so there's a lot of schmoes. There's a lot of MMA smoot and, you know, Joe, what's his name? That are, that are part of this motley crew who received the Holy Spirit. And what that tells me is that Pentecost is for everyone. It's for every man. It's for every woman. It's for you. It's for me. It's for us. And in fact, as I pointed out, Acts 2 records that there were 15 different nationalities that received the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, but it does say every nation under heaven, so although 15 are called out, this is again similar to, we know the names of the 12, down to the 11 on Pentecost, but we don't know the 72. So we know the 15 nations who are called out, but we don't need to know the names of all the others because there were enough people gathered there in Jerusalem. We know that historically, mainly from Roman historians, but also uh, from Josephus, that typically Jerusalem would swell and fill with more than a million visitors for Passover, for Shavuot, uh, for these great holiday festivals. And so, you know, these are people who would, as we would say, cross land and sea in order to participate in what God was doing. Now, we've seen glimpses of that, for example, at Azusa Street, which is you know, just down the highway about 60 miles. People came from everywhere in a time when no one really traveled by air. They'd get on steamships and they'd come here. They'd travel by rail across the United States. Um, horses, they remember that Azusa Street started in a stable, suggesting that horses were still in use back in those years. But people came from everywhere, however they came in order to participate in it. And I think there's something of that that's happening too. There's a great gathering that's going to happen here in, in Southern California once again. Speaking of unstopping new wells. It's going to yeah. happen. Yeah. And so if you, if you followed what I was saying from Acts 2, and you followed the passage I read in Isaiah 59, and you followed what Joel said in Joel 2, then what we see is that this gift of the Holy Spirit given to the church, this was something which had been promised through two, major, two prophets, one a major prophet, one a minor prophet, respectively Isaiah and Joel. This is something they've been looking forward to for hundreds of and hundreds of years, but which had not yet happened. And Joel even says, in the last days. That means it's an eschatological event. That means it has very high importance in terms of markers and in the prophetic time clock. And prior to Pentecost, the Holy Spirit only really came on three different classes of people, and it was a very small, restricted number. The first was the prophets. The prophets carried the Ruach Chodesh, and they were allowed to prophesy, enabled to prophesy, because that spirit came upon them. The second group was the priests, and of course Aaron is famously anointed as high priest, but there was an investiture that went on with the priesthood 
and that they would carry the Spirit. But the thing that was interesting about them was while they, they got the Spirit, it was more, as we say, they took it on faith. They didn't do a lot of prophesying. They didn't have a lot of visions. Now and then there'd be one that was that way. Jeremiah was a guy like that. Uh, but, but for the most part, they were non-charismatic. And then the third group was kings. But at the time of Jesus' coming, and immediately afterward, although they knew the line of the kings, that's why they could trace that in Jesus' genealogy, there was no king. Because the kingship had been, well, maybe not completely destroyed, but it had certainly been uh, disrupted. It had been disintermediated as a result of the conquest of Judah about 500 years before. And so there was an understanding that there was this, well, they probably would have said it rather than he. They didn't quite understand the personality of the Holy Spirit very clearly in the Old Testament. Some of the prophets might have referred to him that way, but... Uh, there was a bit of confusion about who is this Holy Spirit? What is this Holy Spirit? And anyway, we don't see that much of him, uh, him, him, her, or it, whatever we're going to say. And, and so they were kind of waiting for something that they, as I say, didn't know what they were waiting for. But there's a lot of scripture behind all of this. And don't forget that Shavuot is tied to the giving of the law, the Torah. And so what does this tell you? Pentecost, as we call it, is actually a celebration of the merging of word and spirit. Wow. Wow. And we haven't seen that one in a while. Wow. But it's happening. Jill's getting lightheaded. Are you going to fall out of the aisle? Okay. <laughs> I see you, though. <laughs> Somebody get her a cold compress. Now, let's, let's just think about the history that they're that these, these people who are in the upper room, I suppose these are the very scriptures they were praying back to God during their 10 days of waiting prior to the coming of the Spirit. We have Moses' impartation of the Spirit to the 72 elders around the tent of meeting. Now because it's a Sunday sermon and we got to get the kiddies out of Sunday school on time and we, we just can't turn this into a long Bible study, I'll give you the address. You can look it up later if you want to. But um, in Numbers 11, uh, verses 16 and 17, but then going on to verses 24 and 25, <clears throat> the Lord says to Moses, you know, the weight of the people is too much for you. You need some help. So take of the 72 elders, thus the significance of the 72 whom Jesus sent out. And I'm aware there's a variant tradition of 70. I think 72 is right, so that's why I'm preaching it. There's a lot of reasons why, but again, too much for a Sunday sermon. Um, so I think Jesus is paralleling that when he sends the 72 uh, because we have the 12 patriarchs, that's the 12 apostles, now being paralleled by the 72 elders of Israel in Moses' time with the 72 whom Jesus sends out. He says, bring them out to the tent. I'm going to take some of the spirit that's on you, and I'll put him on them. Um, and, but they will prophesy only once. They will not continue to do so. And that's what happens. Now, there are two yahoos named Eldad and Medad. <laughs> or Eldad and Medad. Um, that's Hebrew for dumb and dumber. Because <laughs> if you're going to, if you're going to, like, think about this. The Holy Spirit, and only Moses and Aaron at this time have him. That's it. And it's like, hey, yo, 72 of you get to drink from the well. Why don't you come out to the tent of meeting, and there I'll put my spirit on you. And I, all I can say is those guys better have had amoebic dysentery and been stuck in the latrine. That would be the only acceptable excuse for not being there at the tent that morning. I'm just trying to make it real, right? Okay, so they don't make it, but somehow the spirit of God, they're nominated, they're designated anyway. He comes down upon them, and at the very end of Numbers 11, verses 26 to 29, Joshua comes running to Moses. He says, Moses, my Lord, stop them. They're not by the tent. They shouldn't be prophesying like this. And Moses says, are you jealous for my sake? And then he says one of the most significant things in the entire Old Testament, and especially at this early date. 
This is 1,500 years before Pentecost. Would to God that all the Lord's people were prophets and he would put his spirit upon them. Ooh, Bang, there it, there it is. So there's already an anchor point put down. This is what we are looking for. This is what we want. We want the spirit on everybody, not just the, you know, the, the Moseses right. and the Aaron's, the, the big guys. All right, then, um, as Moses is preparing to go, we don't know exactly when it happened, but Deuteronomy 34, verse 9, notes that Moses had laid his hands on Joshua. And that was what allowed Joshua to have that same uh, impartation. By the way, he, he was present there at the tent of meeting, so he probably got that same grace that was poured out in Numbers 11, but he gets something yet beyond that because he's commissioned into the role of being the new leader of Israel. We see other examples later on. Samuel's impartation to Saul with a kiss followed by the Spirit falling upon him as he gets near uh, Rachel's tomb in Zelza. This story is found in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 10, verses 1 to 6. And Samuel prophesies to him, he says, The Spirit of God will come upon you in power, and then you will be changed into a new man. So there's an expectation that, that there will be something visible, something obvious that will manifest on Saul. This is the first time we see that kingly anointing I mentioned. Uh, coming to him. All right. Then Saul strikes out. So David gets a similar kind of impartation in 1 Samuel 16, 12, and 13. But what's interesting is we don't really see that kind of uh, exhibition of the Holy Spirit thereafter, other than arguably, and I do think it is arguable, when, um, when Solomon is anointed at the Gihon Spring. Because there's no real mention of the Spirit coming on him in that same way. But he is anointed by the high priest. But we don't really see this kind of description with regard to the to the, either the Israelite or the Jewish kings after Saul and David. And then um, later on in the story of David and Saul, Saul comes to take care of David himself in uh, Ramach, which is the hometown of Samuel, Samuel, and uh, today, by the way, that town is called Ramallah. It's in the uh, what's called the West Bank. And then finally, we see Elijah's impartation to Elisha via his cloak when he's taken up to heaven. Two Kings, chapter two, verses nine to twelve. So there are these snapshots, but they're not numerous. I've just given you the entire list of this sort of thing in the Old Testament. But all of them pointed toward the two great prophetic promises, which we already read. So I won't read them again, but I'll reference them again. Isaiah 59, 21, the promise that the spirit that was on Isaiah would be given to all the people of Israel. And then Joel, the spirit would be poured out on all flesh, everybody. As John Wimber used to say, would get to play. So... That's what these guys have in their background. You may not have it in yours, but now you do. And the reason you may not have it is because the church today is essentially Gentile. But these stories are in our Bible for a reason, and there's a reason the Old Testament is also still included in the Bible. People who say it doesn't matter are wrong. And so we can see these prophetic truths, these prophetic markers, and that's what they would have been praying into. That's what they would have been thinking about. And when Jesus says, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence, to his own apostles, they're thinking, wait, we're living in that time? We've been, we've been waiting on this since Moses. We've been hearing about this in the prophets, the Nevi'im. When, when, when we go to synagogue or when we're in temple, and we've never really understood it fully. We, we kind of knew there was something there, and we wanted it. We knew it was an amazing promise because it's God's own spirit is going to be in our bodies, is going to be upon us. And even if we aren't prophets, even if we aren't kings, we, we can still somehow partake in that. What an amazing thing, but for 1,500 years they've been waiting for that. Now, just to give that a little bit of reference, 1,500 years ago is when Rome fell. 
It's actually 1,600, but who's counting at that distance, right? So, I mean, we're talking like since the fall of Rome, we've been waiting for something to happen. That kind of a distance. And they're like, yeah, we're going to pray hard. I can do anything for 10 days. I'm going on a 10-day fast. I might even do a 10-day water fast if I can survive it. Right? And they're calling out, and they're, they're not Shaba Shaba because they don't speak in tongues yet. <laughs> By the way, that's the, that's the eschatological significance of the gift of tongues. People often say, why do we need tongues? Because God said the Spirit would be poured out on all flesh, all nations. Yeah. And it needed to happen that there would be tongues as confirmatory proof that God was fulfilling an eschatological promise to give the Spirit not only to the Jewish people, but to all nations as well. Prior to that, all they had was prophecy, and guess what? It was all in Hebrew or Aramaic. So that's why tongues matters. That's why we want more tongues, not less. Because it's our way of saying, everybody's welcome. We don't care what nationality or skin tone you have or race or whatever. We don't care. This is for everybody. And we're acting it out, not just saying it. All right. So Pentecost then becomes an expansion of what Jesus had done with his disciples. Because he had imparted to them before he sent them out. And they used that anointing they had received. But it's a little bit like... um, a little bit like this. This is an analogy many people would get. When he sent them out, it was like he pulled out his wallet. I don't know if they really had wallets then, but they sure didn't have credit cards. But it's like he pulled out his wallet and gave him his credit card and said, go shopping, I'll pay the bill. And so they were using his anointing. They're trading on his anointing because they're operating under that commission that he'd given them. But at Pentecost, what he's doing is he's investing them. He's saying, oh, by the way, give me back my credit card. Here's one of your own. And so that's the, that's the significance of Pentecost. And so after Pentecost, now the Pentecost, the one we read about in Acts 2, there's actually a series of ongoing Pentecosts that happen. They're obviously much smaller. 3,000 were added to the church on Pentecost Sunday when we... Uh, when we read this account, although I didn't read that passage that states it, it does say 3,000, about 3,000 were added to their number. But here are a couple of subsequent Pentecosts. When Philip goes to Samaria, he preaches the word of God to them, and they believe. Jesus had said the gospel will go Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria. Okay, so we've got Jerusalem nailed down on Pentecost. Presumably something else was going on afterward. doesn't say exactly what, who, how, where, when, but it did. And now we're in Samaria, and Philip is preaching in Samaria. And so when the disciples find out, they send Peter and John to them that they would receive the Holy Spirit. And it says in Acts 8 that he had not yet fallen on any of them. They had believed. They had received water baptism, but they had not been filled with the Holy Spirit. And so the, 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 the apostles in Jerusalem say, we need a new Pentecost. We need these new ingathered Samaritans, the great unwashed. We remember that whole thing with Samaritans. The great unwashed, the people we wouldn't associate with, even they believed, well, all right, we better, we better get them in with the Holy Spirit too. Who would have thought that even Samaritans could receive what they could? So the circle is widening. And then um, we have this murderer named Saul, who becomes later known as Paul. And he is confronted on the Damascus Road by none other than Jesus himself. And when he is converted, he's blinded. And a man named Ananias, who lives in Damascus, finds him in the house where he's staying, comes to him, and he lays his hands on him, and he receives the Holy Spirit. So this tells us that not just Samaritans, but people who have led truly horrible lives, who have been very offensive, they too can receive the Holy Spirit. And at that moment, of course, the scales fall from his eyes, etc. But but Paul gets his own Pentecost. It's a one-to-one. By the way, um, Eusebius says that... Uh, this Ananias who lived in Damascus was one of the 72. 
It's, it's an ancient church tradition. It's hard, you can't verify for sure that it's right, but I'd say the odds are higher than lower that it is correct. So one of the 72, this guy, Ananias of Damascus, he seemingly now imparts the spirit to Paul. Then we have Cornelius and the Roman Gentiles. You might remember that Peter falls into a trance and he gets, uh, he gets summoned. And he goes, and when he walks in, I wouldn't say this is the way to win friends and influence people. He walks in and he goes, hey, you know, according to our law, I'm not even supposed to be here. And uh, so what, why did you call me anyway? And by the way, I, I missed lunch for this. <laughs> and so while he's talking, boom, the Holy Spirit falls. And so Peter's like, oh my gosh, even the Roman soldier and his friends and family they can receive the Holy Spirit. Well, we better baptize them in water. So the order's reversed. But again, it's the confirmation of all nations because no, the Romans hadn't been named in that list in Acts 2. And then in Acts 19, Paul comes into Ephesus and he finds, interestingly, about 12 men. Now, how hard is it to count to 12? 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 11, 12. There, okay, I just did it. So it, it would have been easy to do, but that's suggesting to us that, that Paul's about to do something that's replicating what Jesus did. Jesus had 12, Paul's got now about 12. And out of that emerges a great revival that in two years shakes the entire western end of what we today call Turkey. And so there's something of that new Pentecost that Paul carries with him as he goes there. So when we see these stories, what we see is it is the intention of God that Pentecost not just be something that we note in Acts 2, that we think about that happened approximately, sorry, I got a bug up here, uh, something that happened approximately uh, 1990 years ago because this is only 2024, and you think Jesus rose from the dead in 33, so do the math on that. So just short of 2,000 years ago. But there's an ongoing series of Pentecosts that are supposed to be occurring as the Word of God is proclaimed and as the Gospel expands, and with that, there should be comparable impact with world-changing results. That should be where we are focused. So we celebrate Pentecost because the Holy Spirit came and provided the first, what I will call, wholesale impartation. That, hey, let's switch credit cards. I'm giving you your own. When we think of this word impartation, it's, it, it's popular in charismatic circles today. We, we use it a lot. What is impartation? It's divine enablement. It's, it's the ability that we can be those other people who aren't the eleven in our era. Remember we said 120, we know the names of 11 of them, but we don't know the names of any of the others. We can speculate, probably be right to some degree, but there are these unknown people, but still 120 receive, and those 120 become the nucleus, they become the, the critical mass that makes the church begin its explosive growth, such that ultimately even Rome falls to the, to the gospel. And I think that's a really profound message that we want to be giving to people is everybody can receive this, everybody gets to play, and God's purposes have not changed from then until now. That's, right. that's what this really means. So when we talk about impartation, this is a noun that means to give or to convey or to grant from one to another. And it will give us the ability to carry out the work of God. Now, there are a lot of things that hold us back from the Word of God. Sometimes we feel guilty over past misdeeds. Sometimes we just feel shame. Uh, we feel we're not good enough, we're not worthy, blah, 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 blah. The story goes on and on and on. But sometimes it's almost like we got to, what was the song we were singing? Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Sometimes we just got to get beyond that and say, yeah, okay, hit me up, God. Give me that Holy Spirit you gave them yep. in such a way that I can actually start making an impact and a difference because yep. that's always been your intention yep. from yep. Moses yep. right down through the Romans yep. and yep. even the Ephesians. Yep. They were as Gentile as a dirty, mold polytheist and, 
you know, the sodden in their sexual sin and their drunken orgies and the, they, they had it all, but still they could get the Holy Spirit. So whatever I may have done is probably not as bad as what they were doing. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and here's the thing. In Hebrews chapter 6, at verse 2, we see this simple little admonition. Let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ. Now that doesn't mean leave it behind, but... Don't camp out on it. The elementary doctrine of Christ is, okay, he came, he died, he rose again, and you should believe in him. Let's not just camp out there. Let's go on to maturity and not lay again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. That which I just said, I just summarized it in modern English. And of instruction about various washings, baptisms, and the laying on of hands, and the resurrection of dead and eternal judgment, and this we will do if God permits. So... It's the intention of this writer to the Hebrews, by the way, it's not Paul, but it's probably Barnabas that we're hearing here. Um, but what he's saying is we need to get these important teachings that include at this moment on this day that we call Pentecost, this business of laying on of hands unto the reception of the Holy Spirit. That's part of moving on in Jesus, or maturing in Jesus. Again, we're not leaving anything behind. We're just kind of building the base. And so, um, the other basic doctrines are teachings about the right or wrong way to think or live. But this one single item, impartation, deals with doing as opposed to mental assent or believing. Isn't that interesting? The, there's only one on that list in Hebrews 6. And it has to do with us being activated, us being people who are kingdom bringers, those who do what they did because we have the same spirit that they have. And so this impartation, it can be sovereign, i.e. direct from God. That's what happened to the 120 on the day of Pentecost because, well, because there was no one to lay hands on them, right? Jesus was up in heaven at that point. And so God had to release this sovereignty. He sometimes still does that. Other times, there might be, as with Paul and the Ephesian believers, the laying on of hands, as with Ananias of Damascus and Paul, or as with Peter and John when they go to the Samaritans. So there isn't one only one way to do it, but the point is that it happened. That's the, that's the big takeaway. And so, in conclusion, what we can say is that this idea of Pentecost, now maybe in more localized impartations, um, is part of the normal Christian life, and it is something that every single Christian ought to be receiving. Yeah. Yes. Everybody. Yes. I could even say it's not optional, but for a lot of people they think it is. Right. But I'll just say this, if you missed out on that, you're missing some of the fun of the Christian life. Because who doesn't want to raise the dead? Who doesn't want to be transported to Santa Barbara, maybe, in the spirit? I don't know. <laughs> Woo! There he goes. Uh, you know, who doesn't want to see the blind see? Who doesn't want to see... Fill it in. Who doesn't want that? And you won't ever be able to enter into that dimension of the Christian life without this anointing that comes through the Holy Spirit Jesus himself said, flesh gives birth to flesh. So if you're trying to do this out of your own best ideas or the power of the human soul, it's going to fall flat. You will not bear the fruit that will remain, not that fruit. You might bear some other fruit that's perhaps worthwhile. But I think we want the whole panoply of what God has to offer. And so we must have the Holy Spirit to do this because spirit gives birth to spirit. This is John 3, 6 that I'm quoting. And so, um, I will just say this. I believe the Lord is going to give this kind of outpouring this morning to anybody who's hungry for this. Yeah. Uh, but, but you're going to need more than just the, the blast from the past. Um, you do need that, and you won't get anywhere without it. But the other thing that's interesting is there's a whole training that goes with this. Now, in Jesus' case, he trained them in advance of his going. But he did tell them, go make disciples, train everybody that will come after you 
in what I taught you. So the more common order that we see nowadays is that people get the blast from the past and then they get training to take them to a higher level of proficiency and fruitfulness and blessing and so on. All right, so with that, uh, what I want to do is, I want to just ask a question. Is there anybody here who's never been filled with the Holy Spirit and spoken in tongues? I, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a tongues-only guy, but I, why would you want to miss that too, right? So let's just get everything that's available. Is there anyone here who's not spoken in tongues? Okay, there's a few of you. Excellent. I want you guys to come up to the front. And uh, if you want to get this, you don't have to. Or there's no gun to your head. But if you'd like to be filled with the Spirit and receive that gift today, and then prayer team that came with me and anybody who's from, uh, from your church, Limitless, who's on the prayer team, come on up. It's not going to hurt. <laughs> it might tickle a little bit, depending on how the Holy Spirit manifests. Don't stack in the aisles. You won't get what you want. Come on, we'll just crowd the altar. It's all right. Yep, come on up. Don't stack in the aisles. We got lots of room here. All right. We got room on this side. We got a little bit of room on that side. Anybody who's really wanting to run after it, my own wife is down there on the end. You could get Mrs. Stitch to break <laughs> All right, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to come and descend on you. That's right. Now, one of the things that's interesting, a lot of times people get confused about this. There's two major blockages to receiving this gift. This won't take long. The first one is people think God's going to grab your tongue and start making you speak. Now, sometimes it'll, it'll come flowing out of you, fair enough. But there, it does say they were speaking in tongues as they were enabled, or as the Spirit gave them utterance. So you'll need to start speaking, and what will come out will be what the Spirit is enabling you to speak. The second thing I want to say, and this is a huge issue in places like the United States of America. I don't run into it in places where we aren't quite so educated. I notify, notice this guy's got a shirt on that says Occupy Mars. Do you work for JPL or something? <laughs> SpaceX, okay. So, you know, we're, we're very intellectual people. And here's what we think. If I don't recognize this language, it's not legit. Now, that doesn't mean you speak it. Okay. Living here in Southern California, as an example, most people kind of know what Spanish sounds like, whether or not they speak it. They go, yeah, that sounds Hispanic. I've heard plenty of it. And so they're looking for something to sound Hispanic, or maybe Russian, or, <laughs> or maybe it is a bit French. <laughs> <laughs> it sound like that. It be a real Forget all that. Forget all that. Because there's been more than 30,000 languages in the history of the human race. Many of them don't even exist anymore. There's only about 7,000 living languages right now. So let's say you started speaking in Latin. Would you recognize it? Most likely not. How about Sanskrit? How about Walto Ugaritic? Or ancient Aramaic? So you wouldn't know what it is. It doesn't mean it's not legit. But in our minds, we're like, well, I don't recognize it can't be legit. I'm not saying that. Because someone will laugh at me or think I'm making it up. This is a huge blockage for particularly Americans and guys who work in places like SpaceX. <laughs> That's good. All right, are we ready? Yes. Is that Moses right there? That is Moses. Moshe, how are you? <laughs> He's praying. That's good. All right, if you came to receive, hold out your hands. And the team will lay hands on you. And, and you guys in the aisle, it's okay to push up to the front. We don't want you, we don't want you to miss out. Come right on up here. We've got a space right here for you. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank you that as we gather in this tent today, as they gathered by that tent back in the days of Moses, we're standing on 3,500 years of tradition. For more than 3,000 years, they were looking for this very thing to happen. And we're asking for our own Pentecost here in Thousand Oaks today. Now, Holy Spirit, come upon these who have come forward, and we ask you to touch them. We ask you to burst forth as waters in the desert. We ask you to anoint their lips, whether with heat or buzzing. 
We ask you to give them sensations in their throats and mouths, that this would be something that gives them courage and gives them confirmation and solace. Father, we ask in Jesus' name that as they speak, they would not shrink and draw back out of concern or fear. In the name of Jesus, pour out your spirit, Father. Pour out your spirit. Fulfill the 10 days of waiting that's already gone on in this tent. And all of you that have come up, receive that gift of the Holy Spirit. Receive and speak. Receive and speak. Receive and speak. Now for those of you that are praying, and they don't seem to be getting it just yet, very gently just tap them on the lips. Not hard. You're not trying to give them a fat lip. Just tap them gently on the lips. That sometimes will help people. Just a very gentle tap. Speak in tongues. There it is. There it is. Right there. It's stronger on this end of the room. That's it. Come, Lord. Come. Come down the road. Come down the road. Come down the road in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Sitting in the chairs. We used to call this. Back to 